alive or worse shit are they dead. The most unique missing persons cases in Berkeley County, arguably two of the strangest in the nation. They're two of the low country's oldest and the coldest. There's no doubt they're connected. Where are Karina Malinowski and Annette Sagers? You could put a body in the swamp, an alligator could get a hold of it and you wouldn't find anything. The only piece of evidence, a note written by an 11 year old girl. And it was, they said it was hastily written. All clues point to the one person of interest named in both cases, the husband and stepfather, Steve Malinowski. Everybody that knew Steve and Corey, how they got along, knew that uh, Steve had to have done something. But why can't police prove it? He said, um, you know, that'd be a good place to bury a body. We meet the responding officer three and a half decades later back at the scene of not one, but two disappearances. His story about the two days that forever haunt him in his sleep. 35 years is a long time to not show what. And the most frustrating reason law enforcement officers have been unable to find the mother and daughter. Unfortunately, you can be that far off, and you might as well be a mile off. Over the next half hour, we dig into this case, explaining the lengths investigators have gone to to solve the secrets in the swamp and the pain from a family which some have taken to the grave. This is Bring Them Home, an ABC News 4 exclusive series aimed at solving cold cases in the Lowcountry. Four years ago, an 11 year old girl named Annette was last seen here where I'm standing on Mount Holly Plantation. It's where she lived. She was waiting for the school bus. We're right off Highway 52. It was a crisp, sunny like today, October morning. But her story doesn't start there. It starts nearly a year earlier, almost to the day and almost the exact same spot from where her mother vanished. A 6,000 acre property nestled in the southern part of Berkeley County is where Karina and her daughter Annette called home in the late 80s. The land stretches from Highway 52 to Highway 176 all the way up to Cypress Gardens Road. Driving by it back then and even today, you wouldn't be able to see the aluminum plant and the home that's housed decades of secrets in the swamp. Really, honestly, I hadn't changed a whole lot from 1987, 88. It's woods, woods and swamp. Karina and Annette lived in a home about a half mile behind this gate with Karina's husband, Steve, and their two boys. Family members I spoke with say they had a rocky relationship. Every time there was trouble, her and Steve fought, she called. How often would she call? Uh, several times a month. Karina's sister-in-law, Sandy, said she never left Steve because of the kids. Sandy says Steve was abusive, but Karina never backed down. And she fought right back. She wouldn't take anything. She's even hit him over the head with a skillet before. Sandy and her husband, Leon, who's Karina's brother, moved around Texas a lot to be near Karina and the kids. She knew Annette well. A sweetheart. My husband just adored her. She was a good little girl. Karina and Steve moved the family to the low country for Steve's job. He was hired to be the caretaker on Mount Holly Plantation during the first decade aluminum was manufactured here. The cabin style house where Karina and Steve live still sits here today, 35 years later, in this wildlife preserve. It's surrounded by tall cypress trees and Spanish moss draping from the branches of massive oaks. There's hundreds of acres of swampland. Karina and Steve had no neighbors, at least no human neighbors. The only living beings nearby, bears and alligators. It was a short time that Corey, as her family called her, and Annette would live here before their faces would be plastered on missing persons posters and bulletins across the country. A 26-year-old mother of three, an 11-year-old innocent little girl, the bond between this mother and daughter was strong, but how coincidental that bond would seal their fate. 
Captain Dean Kakinda with the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office joined the force in 1989, two years after the story began. He joined as a patrol deputy and quickly worked his way up the ranks. He was in the cold case unit when he gave a fresh set of eyes to the decades old cases. And over the years, he's been reassigned to the mother daughter mystery because of how much progress he's made. But I do think about it a lot. In November of 1987, Corey was working at a mom and pop shop, the Oasis convenience store on Main Street in Somerville. Her boss told the sheriff's office she was prompt. That was until the 22nd, just four days before Thanksgiving. She didn't show up to work one morning, and the owner thought that was odd. Her boss was so concerned that he drove about seven and a half miles to her house on Mount Holly Plantation. The drive takes about 15 minutes. As a crow flies, it's a direct shot to the east. When he arrived, he was met by a locked gate and Corey's car coated in dew. He got out and walked up to the house and said, hey, you know, where's Karina? And uh, Stephen's like, um, I don't know, you know, she, you know, we had a fight last night and she left. That was just the start of the many stories investigators say Corey's husband, Steve, told them over the years. She went to leave and he was on the front porch that he could see her getting in another car from her car. Um, the problem with that story is it's that the house is, like I say, probably about a half a mile from the roadway and uh, it's wooded and it's a curvy, curvy driveway to the house. Captain Kokinda told me the investigators knew immediately. Steve lied. Steve also claims his wife was having an affair and ran away with another man. Investigators say that's not true. Part of Captain Kokinda's work over the years has involved speaking in depth to the investigators first to the scene. At the time, it appears she, she had left, but we, we had no concrete evidence of that. L.R. Herod is a retired deputy chief of the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office. He was the first to respond when Corey was reported missing on that late November day in 87. Anybody that's ever involved in this case has the same amount of frustration, I'm sure. Speak to any detective, and most likely they'll tell you they have one case, one story that haunts them even after they retire. This is that case for L.R. Harris. You just wonder, where are they at? Are they alive? Or where shit are they dead? We met the retired deputy chief at the place where this story began. He hadn't been back here in years. LR recalled the specific information he remembers from when he first arrived to the scene. Clear markings on the gravel road where Corey's car rested. Her car was leaking transmission fluid so bad where you could almost trace your car by the transmission fluid. Corey was nowhere to be found. Three children, now without a mother. LR traced all leads after Corey's disappearance, but nothing turned up. Little did he know, he would be back to the same scene less than a year later. He said that she left a note, and the note said that mom came back, and the note was written really hastily, but that's all we had to go on. And Do you think it might have been forcefully written? I can't say for sure. When we come back, Annette disappears. Steve says a crumpled up note claims Corey came back to get her how authorities responded, the suspicious reaction from Steve, and the chilling stories leading up to Annette's disappearance, which have never been told by the news before. The missing persons cases of 11-year-old Annette Sagers and Corey Malinowski are two of the strangest in the nation. A mother and daughter both reported missing nearly a year apart. The stepfather claims Corey came back to get her daughter. But why would a mother come back to get one child and not the other two? If she was missing herself, she would have called long enough to say, hey, I'm okay, don't worry about me. And if she had taken Annette, the same thing. She would have called and said, hey, I got Annette. I'm going to get the other boys. Don't worry about me. But we haven't heard nothing. One piece of evidence, a crumpled up note, was left behind when Annette vanished on the morning of October 6, 1988. It was deja vu for Deputy Chief L.R. Herod. He found himself back in his squad car rushing to Mount Holly Plantation, this time for a missing child. He was greeted by a familiar man. 
Steve Malinowski. The deputy chief said he didn't even seem upset. He said that she left a note, and the note said that mom came back, and the note was written really hastily. The note that Steve claims Annette wrote was found here in this area. There used to be a shed where Annette would wait for the school bus. And Steve says that note was found in the shed, untouched until he called the sheriff's office later that day. Technology back then isn't what it is today. However, in the late 80s, handwriting analysis existed. They said that she could have written that note. The analysis wasn't able to determine if she was forced to write it, but investigators were able to confirm Annette was at the bus stop that day. The route the bus driver took on Highway 52 would go past her and into Strawberry just north to make a stop. The driver then turned around to pick her up. At least one that um, was a student back then recalls seeing her at the bus stop. The time frame from when the bus passed her and came back was about 15 minutes enough time for someone to commit a heinous crime. Authorities believe Annette's stepfather had a motive. He started neglecting the kids and it ended up that Annette contacted the caretaker and asked if he could provide her and the brothers with um, food. Hadn't eaten in like three days. So when the caretaker went down there and kind of saw the situation, of course he notified uh, DSS. Um, and I think it was at that point that Stephen may have figured Annette might have been a liability. Did Annette see something or did she know something about what happened to her mother? Based on the way the house was laid out, if something happened, there's a pretty good chance that Annette may have seen it. And that's just my theory. The concern that Annette maybe knew too much started a few days after Corey disappeared when her half-sister Cheryl and father came to visit. Um, she wanted to show me something up in the attic and he wouldn't let her. She doesn't know what, if anything, was up there. Detectives searched the attic. They didn't find anything. Some speculate Steve was hiding Corey's body upstairs. Cheryl and Corey's sister-in-law, Sandy, kept in close contact with Steve. They discovered, according to law, they could get legal custody of her after a year. And Lee could have got her because it wasn't Steve's child. That's what is so weird because just before the year was up, and we almost had her to the house. We talked him into letting her come down for a month in the summertime. He was all for it, was going to do it, and then all of a sudden just changed his mind. Steve showed that same friendliness to Cheryl. I was going to have a surgery, so I was going to come down and visit Annette for a while while I was off work and Steve thought that was great and then he started calling me all the time and he said oh we can do a lot of things when you get down here and all that. Deputy Chief L.R. Harrod had a strong message for Cheryl when she told him about her and Steve's conversations. It's something she's kept close to her all these years, never before sharing to a TV news station. And the lieutenant told me that I was not to go to the house by myself. He was worried about what could happen to her. One week before Cheryl's planned visit, Annette vanished. I've never heard from Cecil. He didn't even call to tell me that Annette was missing. An extensive search ensued. The sheriff's office named Steve a person of interest in both the disappearance of his wife, Corey, and stepdaughter, Annette but they never had enough evidence to charge him. There's been a couple of situations over the years that have got investigators hopeful they might have enough to solve the case, like a rug tied with electrical cord found in a pond on the property near the home. But there was nothing in the carpet, and he said it was it had been in the water, it was all black. Kokinda doesn't believe it would have been the smoking gun that solved the case, but it would have helped had it been more thoroughly investigated, which he blames on personnel changes in the office. The case went cold for 10 years until they received an anonymous letter in 2000. Captain Kokinda was working in forensics at the time. The anonymous letter said that uh, they were buried in Sumter County, and it, it gave a very specific location. Yeah, it's kind of a crossroads. The sheriff's office and SLED searched the area with cadaver dogs. We processed the letter for fingerprints. We processed it for DNA, um, and we've never been able to identify you know, who wrote the letter. Another dead end that would last years until one of Steve's friends got some loose lips. He came forward in 2016 with a conversation between him and Steve one night when they were riding back roads on Mount Holly Plantation. 
they came upon a big hill with dirt piled high. Steve said something that stuck with him all these years. He said, um, you know, that'd be a good place to bury a body. And this, of course, this was prior to um, Karina going missing. You heard that right, a good place to bury a body. Chilling words that would lead to the most recent search for the mother and daughter. When we come back, we speak with the canine handlers assigned the task and the major reason law enforcement leaders believe they've been unable to bring them home. Law enforcement leaders believe they are closer than ever to solving the missing persons cases of 11 year old Annette Sagers and her mother, Corey Malinowski. The biggest clue in the decades old cold cases came from a friend of Steve's who said Steve told him an area on Mount Holly Plantation was a good place to bury a body. It's a remote area on the land near a pond. We've always concentrated on that one area. The Berkeley County Sheriff's Office got to work with the help of the South Carolina Canine Search Team. These cadaver dogs are trained to find the scent of human decomposition. The older the case, the less odor, making it hard for the dogs to pick up. It's a large area that, that is involved and you're looking for that proverbial needle in a haystack. We met the canine team in Richland, where they showed us how they work. Meet Finn and Riker. They were tasked with finding this. Blood on a single square of a gauze pad in a pill container, covered up under a chunk of mowed grass. The find was simple for these two. They alerted to the scent within a couple minutes. That's not always the case. Over time, wind and water move a scent making it difficult for good boys like Finn and Riker to find the source. You're talking about source that is probably bound to an underground water that's moving all through the soil profile can be extremely difficult because it might pop up over here where the source of the odor could be, you know, over the years, you know, 500 yards in another direction. The sheriff's office believes that's the case with this story. They worked with a hydrologist with the DNR and the geology department at College of Charleston to develop a mathematical equation that helped narrow their search area in 2019. Dr. Norman Levine is a professor at the college. Because it's wet, things can be degraded faster. He's an expert on the topic and explains water's impact. If we're talking about uh, bodies or, or parts of a crime scene, it's gonna move that part down with it and deposit it where that water then spreads out or slows down. So they get moved and buried often at the same time. Dogs alerted to the smell of human decomposition when they searched Mount Holly Plantation. They dug about 20 holes over the course of a year and a half. We were trying to work our way upstream on the water table and seeing where's, where's the source of the, of the scent. They found nothing. But Captain Kakinda believes they're close, and he believes the mother and daughter never left the plantation. Do you think if you find one, you'll find the other? I believe so. Prime suspect Steve Malinowski lives in Florida today. He got out of jail a few years ago after pleading guilty and serving time for child abuse in an unrelated case. Captain Kokinda spoke with him while he was in jail. He did talk to us, but you know, he basically said, no, I didn't have nothing to do with it. He wants Corey and Annette's family to know he won't give up. The pain they feel has been unbearable for her brother, Leon. He had a lot of stress on him about Corey. I'm sorry. Sandy's husband died from a heart attack a few months ago. She believes his heart failed because of the heartache over the loss of his sister and niece. He just wished he knew where his sister was. He loved to miss her. And that, you know, he, he wished he could hold his, his uh, niece again, but he said he knew in his heart he would never be able to. And I wish there was a sign that he could let me know that he is home with his sister and niece. Law enforcement officials hope the secrets in the swamp aren't kept here on Mount Holly Plantation forever. If you have any information on the disappearance of Karina and Annette, call Berkeley County Sheriff's at 843-719-4465. Let's bring them home. I'm Melanie Orleans.